Today's topic is about Iran. The format will be a moderated panel. So we'll have our three distinguished speakers up here. I'll feed questions and encourage each of you to do so as well with the note cards that are at the table. I'd also like to thank the World Affairs Council of America's president, who's here, Bill Clifford, if you just raise your hand, came in from DC today, uh, the sponsor of today's program, along with the Iran Project. And we have Iris and Katya are here. Raise your hand so people know where you are. Great. Please join me in thanking these sponsors for today's program. That, of course, is with support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and our promotional partners, The Ohio State University, really a key partner in, in almost everything that we do, and the Jewish Federation of Columbus. And I saw Gordon and Bob here today. Thank you for promoting and getting the word out to our whole community. So let me introduce Bill Clifford. Bill is the president of the World Affairs Council of America. He started in that role in 2013 after almost a decade of leading World Boston, which is our counterpart in Boston. Uh, he had so much success there that the national board, including me, tapped him to lead our national office, and he's been doing so with success and excellence that we expect from the World Affairs Council of America. And please join me in welcoming Bill Clifford to the stage. Thank you, Patrick. It's very nice to be here today and to welcome the audience via live stream as well. Uh, I just want to congratulate Patrick and the wonderful job he and his team, Susie and Brad and others, have done to basically put dozens of programs before you, uh, like these signature luncheons and also the educational uh, initiatives. Patrick and the, and the Columbus Council are really models in the network. That's why he's been serving on the board and advising and leading our global education task force. So I really appreciate what you're doing here. What we do at 95 councils across the country is we convene experts, policymakers, heads of state and leaders uh, from the business community and the nonprofit world to share ideas to, to inform the public so that we make our democracy stronger. It doesn't get any more simple or important than that. And it's a pleasure to work with the Iran project on this particular Engage America series. From here, we'll have uh, two West Coast destinations, Seattle and Portland, and we'll be back in Ohio and Cleveland at the council there in June. And we'll have other uh, councils participating in this series on the Iran deal and problems and opportunities in the Middle East that face the United States. So very briefly, on July 14, 2015, last year, the United States and five other nations, the Security Council members, U UK, Russia, China, France, and also Germany, along with Iran, reached the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This is a 159-page historic agreement designed under American leadership to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs because that's what the experts are here to do for you. It's complex. We need to understand it. We have a media nowadays that puts opinions before you before they put facts. These councils do work to get you thinking about the issues, to make up your own mind, and, and then either vote or choose or decide things that will make your life better. That's what we do. So with that, I'd like to welcome our three distinguished panelists to the stage, Dr. Jessica Matthews, Richard Nephew, and Dr. Richard Herman. Dr. Jessica Matthews, to my immediate left, is a distinguished fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, DC. She served as Carnegie Endowment's president for 18 years. Before her appointment in 1997, she was director of the Council on Foreign Relations Washington program and a senior fellow there from 94 to 97. Dr. Matthews has had a career including posts in both the executive and legislative branches of government, in management and research in the nonprofit arena, and in journalism and science policy. To her left, 
is Richard Nephew, who is a research scholar and program director at the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University in New York. Richard is also a non-resident senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings Institution, where he is affiliated with the Arms Control and Nonproliferation Initiative housed within the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. During his career, Richard has served as the Principal Deputy Coordinator for the Sanctions Policy at the U.S. State Department and Director for Iran at the National Security Council. He also served as the lead sanctions expert for the U.S. team negotiating with Iran. And then on the far left from me is Dr. Richard Herman, who is Professor and Department Chair at the Department of Political Science at The Ohio State University and he concentrates on international relations, international security, and political psychology. He was the director of the Mershon Center of Inter for International Security Studies and has served on, as a Council of Foreign Relations Fellow on the Secretary of State's Policy Planning Staff in Washington, D.C. He's also the author of many publications, including the book on perceptions and behavior in Soviet foreign policy. Welcome, panelists. Thank you. I'll welcome Patrick back up here, and thanks for presenting today. All right, I'd like to just start from the beginning. Uh, so what's the deal? <laughs> um, and uh, Richard, for, by the way, we're Richard and Rick, so that we keep that straight, <laughs> and Jessica. Um, but Richard, could you give us, you know, the, the basics, you know, the bullet points of what the deal is? Sure, I mean, the, I, I think that to put it very simply, the Iran deal is an exchange of deep restrictions on Iran's nuclear program that are verified by intrusive transparency measures in exchange for sanctions relief. And the Iranians accepted restrictions on their nuclear program that, frankly, a lot of folks thought were uh, never going to be possible. They accepted a two-thirds restriction on the number of centrifuges they could operate. And centrifuges are the way they could get enriched uranium for use in nuclear weapons. They accepted permanent modifications of reactors in the country that could produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. And they accepted the kinds of transparency steps that allow the United States to be able to confirm that it has no covert nuclear weapons program operate elsewhere in the country. And these really have become known as the three pathways to a bomb, the uranium path, the plutonium path, and the covert path, all of which have been blocked off as a result of this deal. Now, that's not simply because, in fact, the restrictions exist, but because they're being verified and because there are going to be uh, a number of measures uh, for transparency and monitoring put in place that are going to operate throughout the entire duration of the deal. Iran is going to have to have its centrifuge stocks verified by international inspectors. Its active uranium enrichment activities are going to be monitored online by international inspectors. And all of this is going to take place amid continued U.S. intensive intelligence gathering to ensure, in fact, that Iran is doing what it's saying, that inspectors aren't uh, missing something that's very important. In exchange, Iran got sanctions relief and sanctions relief that was uh, necessary for them to be able to have any kind of new economic growth. Sanctions relief covering its ability to trade with most of the rest of the world. But this sanctions relief wasn't total. The United States remains closed to Iran, except for a very uh, few and very specified number of sectors. And in fact, there are still a number of foreign interactions with Iran, especially in banking, that are potentially subject to additional U.S. sanctions if they involve things like support for terrorism violations of human rights, development of ballistic missiles. So I think the best way of summarizing the deal is there were a number of specific nuclear-related steps accepted by Iran that are going to be verified by a number of very intrusive monitoring steps for 10 to 15 years, all contingent on Iran getting sanctions relief. And then at that point, that 10 to 15 year period, we'll have to regroup and see what is left of the deal, see whether or not it can be continued and sustained, or see whether or not another path is necessary. Good. Thank you, thank you. Um, Jessica, could you give us, you know, we, are, we hear about the deal from the U.S. side and don't know a lot about the domestic politics in Iran before, during, and after the deal. Could, could you give us a sense for the, the context within which this deal was brokered uh, on the Iran side? Yeah. Um, first, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a beautiful city. I've never been here before, so it's a, a great pleasure for me. And I start by apologizing for my voice. I don't normally sound this way. Um, there's a famous movie in which this man and woman of 
introducing themselves to each other, falling in love, and, and he introduces himself in three minutes, hopping on one foot, and tells his whole life story. This is going to be kind of like that <laughs> a effort to, um, to give you a picture of, of what's the most important things in Iran very fast. First of all, it's a, an incredibly young uh, country, en enormous demographic shift towards youth, best educated population in the Middle East, most pro-American population in the Middle East, which suggests that absence does make the heart grow fonder. Um, uh, and, and, you know, American visitors sort of uniformly come back shocked at the, of the warmth of the reception that they uh, receive. Also, it is a country um, that is really tired of being international outcast. Um, in, and, and now I just want to say a word about Iran's weird um, uh, political arrangements. It is a vibrant democracy embedded in an ideological and often very cruel autocracy. And it's really hard to understand it because there are so many different entities, um, some of which are elected and some of which are not. So that, for example, in their last presidential election, their turnout was 50% higher than the most recent American election. Vibrant. Public debates, televised debates, their foreign policy debate was three hours long. Um, but the only candidates who get to run are candidates approved by an entity called the Guardian Council, which is not an elected entity. And in that case, there were something like 300 applicants that wanted to run for president and only six who were approved. But of those six, one, Rouhani, the current president, uh, campaigned on a platform of wanting to get this nuclear problem resolved. Very explicit um, and obviously with the approval of the supreme leader because otherwise you don't get to do that. And so in a field of six, Rouhani got eked out a majority. Uh, so there was a clear domestic uh, desire to get this thing um, uh, out of the way and resolved in some way. And at the same time, it was clear that the Supreme Leader wanted that to happen. More recently, within the last month, there were um, uh, elections for the parliament, the majlis, and for another body called the Assembly of Experts. Um, which gets to, to pick the next supreme leader. So it's a very important and, and body. They, they also get to pick their name, apparently, and, the assembly of and, experts. Um, in this case, again, uh, you know, the candidates get picked in advance. And um, uh, almost in many districts, they didn't allow even one moderate to run. And yet, uh, the moderates scored a very substantial victory it's, we don't have the final figures yet because there's about a quarter of the seats that need to face a runoff. But there's been a clear shift towards the center um, and in both the two bodies. Uh, and so that sets up um, the next presidential election. So what we're seeing is a population that said very clearly, we want to be back in the world. Getting the nuclear agreement is, um, is the necessary step. Uh, Rouhani also promised both greater freedom and economic reforms, which he hasn't yet been able to deliver on much, and that has a great deal to do with, with the lifting the, and the effective lifting of the sanctions. That's the good news. The bad news is that there's also a very substantial opposition uh, to, to doing anything with the United States um, for two reasons. One is ideological and religious. And the other is that the Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is a very powerful um, entity, has been running the black market in Iran, which has been a flourishing black market made possible because of the sanctions. So I think everybody is aware there have been this whole raft of imprisonments of people who hold joint Iranian and U.S. passports. They won't, they don't arrest Americans, single passport holders, but they don't recognize dual passports as, as valid. And so 
they, they've arrested a whole bunch of these people. And the reasons are, are three. One is the Revolutionary Guard asserting itself back against the reformers. Two is a signal to the diaspora, the Iranian diaspora, which is, there are many very successful um, uh, Iranians in this country and in Europe who wanted to go back. And so this is a signal to say, stay away, right? We don't want you coming back and taking our businesses away and taking our banking system away and doing, and so, so, and that they have very effectively scared off um, some very powerful people who could have made an enormous contribution to reforming the Iranian economy, um, but they, but they, they can't. Um, and, and, uh, um, and also to try to weaken the president um, uh, in advance of, a after ha he has scored what is seen as a huge victory. Um, so it's a, it's a, the, Iran is just a, is a bunch of paradoxes. It's good news, bad news, it's democracy, autocracy together, it's pro-American and the great Satan. Um, and you gotta hold all this in your head at once because otherwise you, you don't see um, uh, much of the picture. The last important paradox is that this deal was rightly framed as only about the nuclear issue because that was the principal block. In, and because Iran was maybe two months from having enough highly enriched uranium to make a nuclear weapon, and we would have had faced a, a very unpleasant set of choices, one of, principal one of which was going to war. Um, and there would have been no way that you could have gotten six countries, including Russia and China, on one side of the table agreeing on a broader agenda, much less agreeing across the table. So we rightly defined this deal as being just nuclear. But as one friend of mine says, this is only about nuclear in the sense that the novel Moby Dick is only about a whale, right? This deal has huge implications for the future, which I hope we will talk about, and which also represent the opportunities, uh, as well as the removal of the most, what is to me, the most, was the most immediate threat that we face. Thank you, that's, that's a great way to think about um, the complications of, the, of this issue. The, so we, we look at the, the deal, you know, what are the specifics of the deal, the context in Iran, and, and Rick, if you would, um, Take us even a little bit further bird's eye, the region. Um, why, what does this mean for the region? And um, what are some of the key dynamics that you think are worth, worth uh, mentioning? Please. You know, Patrick, I've been going back and forth to this region for yeah. 30 years. And it hasn't gotten more peaceful. That's pretty obvious to all of us. And in fact, over the last 15 years, uh, a variety of disputes that had been held under by authoritarian regimes are very obvious to all of us now and have produced both civil wars and across national wars that were confronted over the last 15 to 20 years. If that kind of violence escalates to the nuclear level and twice in the last 15 years, first in Iraq and then more recently in Iran, uh, this country's sort of been mobilized around the threat of the violence in the Middle East escalating to a nuclear dimension. And it led us to war in 2003, and it's led us to this deal uh, a year ago. Two very different ways of trying to deal with a nuclear a proliferation threat, but no one should doubt what the thir concerns were. That is that these vi the violent differences within the Middle East are not likely to go away, not anytime soon. And if it moves to a direction of nuclear violence between them, there's no way we're gonna extricate ourselves from that easily. Even if we could be totally energy independent, the rest of the world cannot be uh, from the Middle East, and we can't extricate ourselves from the rest of the Asian and European markets, which will be continued dependent on that oil coming out of the Persian Gulf. And so we're intricately into this, whether we want to be or not. The question is whether we are in with troops and those kinds of things. But one of the reasons we have the luxury to make the decisions we've been thinking about recently, whether we want to put troops in or not troops or 5,000 or whatever, is that we're not concerned about this becoming a nuclear con uh, consider, uh, conflict which would involve great powers. Uh, 
And <clears throat> I think that's something for us to keep in mind. The question then was how best to make sure that Iran does not go nuclear. And there, you know, we have different options. This, this one is an effort to make a peaceful approach to it in hopes with serious intrusive inspections we can constrain that operation at least for a decade or so. The alternative was to threaten the use of force. Um, and as you've already heard Richard say, the, I mean, the trade-off for us to go this way is to uh, have Iran uh, acquire uh, access to some resources that it otherwise was uh, prohibited from having. Um, the second thing I want to say about the, the broader region, and I'm really going to talk about us as, as Americans and people here in Columbus, whether this accord works or not is not going to be only a function of what uh, the people that Jessica Matthew was describing in Iran decide. It's going to be also what people here in, in the United States decide. Uh, there is not broad consensus in favor of this agreement. I don't think that's uh, a mystery to anyone. Uh, I don't know who will win the election in the fall, uh, but this is obviously at the center of debates about foreign policy, and at least two of the candidates have said they'll walk away from the deal completely. Uh, on the Democratic side, we haven't heard uh, as much about where they would be with the deal, but I guess they're, they don't want to get too deep into that. Talk about, I don't want to stop your flow, but I do want to ask you about what are the arguments against the deal? What are the key the, ones? The key that arguments against the deal are that it allows Iran access uh, to uh, financial resources that the United States is withholding <laughs> since, uh, some of them since the revolution, frankly, and the hostage crisis. Uh, and it would allow them to uh, reemerge on, on the commercial market uh, with European and Asian firms. Iran is a big country. We're talking 70 million plus with real potential economy that would dwarf uh, the capabilities of countries like Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia. We all knew that when we were close allies with Iran, and we, we know it still now. And in many ways, um, there's a concern that we will allow Iran's regime that people fear will not change to simply get resources. Uh, by being able to recover from its isolation. We know they were isolated with a sanctions regime, and some thought maybe we could have pers persisted with that sanctions regime. I don't believe we could. I don't think in the end that the Europeans and the Asians would have stayed with us, but some think we could have held that together and kept them as isolated and as bereft of capability as possible. This is going to allow them to acquire capability, economic wherewithal, science and technological wherewithal. Uh, and that is a, th a concern. If the regime doesn't change, and 15 years from now it's uh, an aggressively anti-American regime, it will have more capacity than it's had now. That's the, the principle I can make of it. Let me say. Add oh, yeah, one go. thing to this, though. Please. I don't know of anybody, American or otherwise, who knows what's in the deal, uh, who opposes it on other than explicitly political grounds. I know that's, some people may find that a shocking statement, but there are, I mean, it's no surprise to anybody in this room, our foreign policy is deeply politicized. Um, uh, the people who insisted that the U.S. could have negotiated an agreement that would have prohibited Iran from enrichment at all, I think, didn't understand. <laughs> what was where they were, um, uh, and the and the only other opposition comes from Prime Minister Netanyahu, but not from his national security establishment, who have said explicitly and on the record that they think it's a strategic turning point for Israel. So, this is among the, Israeli the is chief of the general staff, the former head of Mossad, the former head of the army intelligence, they've all said it. Uh, they do not agree with their prime minister on this, uh, who has called it a historic mistake. They call it a historic turning point. You know, it's, um, uh, hmm. and so I think, um, and in fact, the polling data in the U.S. shows that when people are just asked, do you support the deal? Very few say yes. And when the deal is described, the numbers flip. So, 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 so some of this is, um, we don't know what's in the deal. And so 
we meaning the broader uh, US, um, so we make uh, uh, an opinion based on not knowing the details? Is that what you're saying? I think it's broader than that. I think people How, think, tell us about it. I think people are holding on to a counterfactual that in my view, much like Jessica's, is, is largely a fantasy. That there's a perfect deal out there someplace uh, that, uh, that we could have had or will have in the future that won't require the use of force as the alternative. And I wanted to say that um, I, I'm directing back the Mershon Center again this year. And Bob Jervis, who's a very senior security specialist at Columbia University, a good friend of mine, organized about 30 of us. I ran the center at Ohio State, Columbia, people who run it at the University of Chicago, Harvard. Um, 30 of us who had taken positions on the Middle East very publicly over the last year, we took a big ad out in the New York Times as people who run national security centers saying, on the technical rides, we support this deal. Um, and I, I agree with Jessica that on the, I don't know very many people in the national security community that don't support the deal. Uh, on the grounds that where, where I started, I don't know any other way to stop the nuclear proliferation threat. And on those specific grounds, People support it. You asked me, what is the opposition? What, what's the argument against it? The risk we're taking, and I, we do this with our eyes wide open, is that Iran could acquire capability. And we may be faced in 10 years with a tough choice to use force. But we'd prefer to push that back 10 years and try this alternative strategy in the meantime, rather than confront the use of force in the next 15 months or whatever it might be. And there's a better probability going this route that we'll never have to use that force because, as Jessica mentioned, there is some chance over the next decade that that regime will change and evolve. We saw in 2009 just how unpopular this regime is. They clamped back down with real force after that election in 2009 in Iran. And I don't know what it would be uh, going forward. I'd rather see if, if this regime can hold things in place for the next decade and hope for an alternative. The last point I want to make, we had a deal in the middle 1990s with North Korea that also, uh, as Bob Gallucci, who negotiated that deal, often told me, we leased their deals, it turned out. He thought he had bought it. Um, but it didn't work out uh, quite that way. But that deal fell apart in the late 1990s and 2000, both because of things North Korea were doing and because the US Congress was passing legislation that prohibited us providing the heavy oil to North Korea that was part of that deal. And as it all fell apart, largely because Congress never was on board with it too much to begin with, it fell apart. And we face now a nuclear North Korea. I think this is the last point I want to make about why this is important for people in Columbus. This deal will only survive if both people in Iran and the United States implement it. And there is not collective will in the United States yet to implement it. I don't know what will happen after the, uh, the elections this fall, and we'll have this debate for the next several years, I suspect. But as Richard was beginning to say, Iran is not able to get back into the international market anywhere close to what the proponents of this deal in Iran said they were going to be able to. And that's because so much of the world economy still runs on the dollar, and those dollars have to pass through US banks, and we can stop that flow of US dollars. And if Iran can't, do business in dollars and can't move those to US banks, they're not going to receive the rewards from this that I think a lot of the uh, leaders in Iran were advertising yeah, to let's people. Talk, I was, was going to ask Richard more about the sanctions, because um, I keep reading about it, we've lifted the sanctions. So I, I asked the question. Uh, apparently, I wasn't uh, in the know. I said, well, so is it now open season for US companies? Um, or what's, what's, what's the deal with the deal? I mean, are sanctions lifted? and? We had a long conversation about this over breakfast. So yes or no was not the answer. Right. <laughs> what, what was the answer? So, so the, the right answer is definitely between yes or no. I mean, first, let's, let's, let's start off and think about what US sanctions on Iran look like. There basically are two categories of sanctions you ought to think about. There are what we call primary sanctions and secondary. Primary basically just means US persons doing business with foreign people, right? It's the stopping of a business person here in Columbus from doing business with someone in Iran. Secondary sanctions are a tool we came up with about 15, 20 years ago that prohibit foreign people from doing business with other foreign people by interpersing, inter interpersing ourselves into the transaction by basically saying, if you want to do business with Iran, you can't do business with the United States. 
And this was a pretty effective tool. We used it uh, very aggressively from roughly 2006 until 2013, and we had a major effect on the business decisions of companies in Asia, companies in Europe, companies around the world. And the ultimate impact was a driving down of Iran's economy to the point where they were in a, a massive recession. Uh, they lost $54 billion a year in oil revenues as a result of U.S. sanctions threatening foreign people for doing business with other foreign people. What we've relieved in this deal is mostly that last category. So if you are a business person in Columbus, unless you're doing business in food, uh, medicine, medical devices, aviation spare parts and, and plane spare parts, which was something that we agreed to so as to avoid the specter of Boeing jets crashing out of the sky, since they still have a lot of them from the 1970s, um, by and large, you're not doing business with Iran. It's still prohibited. It's still sanctionable. It's still uh, subject to penalties from, from the Department of Justice and Department of Treasury. What we did relieve were most of the secondary sanctions affecting foreign people's ability to do business with Iran in broad sectors. So allowing Japanese folks to buy Iranian oil, allowing French folks to do banking transactions with Iran, allowing transportation companies that are non-U.S. from going inside uh, of Iran and providing services there. Even then, there are a couple of key conditions. First off is that we've reserved the right to snap back the sanctions of Iran cheats. And although we worked out a dispute process that requires us to have some conversations with our uh, foreign partners, we reserve the unilateral right to both reimpose our own sanctions, if we decide to do so, and to force the UN Security Council to reimpose its sanctions by the exercise of our sanctions veto, our, our, our UN Security Council veto. We can talk about that. The second thing that we've got going on is that we've maintained our secondary sanctions affecting banking transactions and other activities that could involve Iranian support for terrorism, Iranian violation of human rights, support for its ballistic missile program. So if you're a bank in France and you facilitate a transaction that supports terrorism, you're potentially subject to sanctions from the United States. And the consequence of that is that businesses around the world are saying, now wait a minute, I thought these sanctions were gone. They're not gone? You mean that there is a possibility of me being re-sanctioned as a result of some other thing else going on that I don't know about? And the answer to that is yes. So if I'm, if I'm Lego in Denmark and I decide I want to, oh my gosh, Iranian kids now need Legos. I'm going for it. I'm not? You can legally. But now you've got to find a bank that's willing to set up the transactions. Now you have to find a shipping company that's willing to do business there. And you've got to find the kind of insurance protection that allows you to do those sorts of transactions. Now, and this... Well, they, they, they aren't thus far. And this is really Iran's main complaint, and really a point that Rick is speaking to in his comments. The biggest challenge we've seen thus far is that companies are scared to death of U.S. sanctions. And so the result of all this is even though a lot of them are gone, you have banks that are unwilling to move. And it's really a threat to the fundamentals of the deal because if Iran doesn't see the economic relief it paid for in serious and significant nuclear restrictions, those restrictions are going to go away. And by the way, there are already discussions in the Iranian parliament about adding thousands of centrifuges back to their nuclear program because they're not getting the economic relief that they paid for. And this really speaks to an issue about bills that are going through Congress now that look to try and increase sanctions. The last point I just want to make is about the issue of are the sanctions gone or are they still here? Some of U.S. sanctions have been terminated, those that are part of executive orders. But those that are contained in legislation cannot be waived away by any president. They have to be overturned by an act of Congress. And in the deal, it was agreed that won't happen for at least 10 years, and still will require an act of Congress to do so. So one of the other issues here is that a lot of folks out in the international business community say, well, you say the sanctions are gone, but they're still out there, hidden in the darkness, even if they're suspended. How do I know that I'm not going to face them one morning that I wake up and all of a sudden I see sanctions back in place? We're, so uh, when the sanctions were on, were we precluded from buying from Iran, like Iranian products, besides, I mean, so the, re the reason I ask is, can we buy anything we want that's coming out of Iran now? So you can definitely buy food, you can buy cultural items, you can uh, buy agricultural items, um, but other than that, no. The comprehensive embargo on uh, Iran remains in place. So if you wanted to buy an Iranian automobile, you can't. Uh, I'm not sure you would want to. But if you wanted to buy an Iranian automobile, you can't. But if you want to buy a carpet, you want to buy pistachios or caviar, go right ahead. Got it. It's, it's worth also adding part of the bad news is that what the, in addition to this, which is major, the other thing that's holding back foreign investment 
is that, that the Iranians have to do an, a lot of economic reforms domestically in order to make it attractive for international yeah. firms yeah. to come in and to take this risk. And so far they haven't. And this is one of the reasons why it's so unfortunate that, di that the diaspora has been frozen out, because it's the diaspora that could come in and say, here's what we've got to do, here's what we've got to do. We've got to fix a central bank, we've got to have a rule of law, we have to have e accounting transparency, all that stuff. It hasn't happened yet. How do they do that? You mentioned earlier that there's prominent Iranians who are willing to go back. Um, how are they being... You well, know, what, because, are, what are those things that because happen? Because people who hold both passports are being arrested by Arrest. the Revolutionary Guard. And so that's a very effective way to keep that's people from, that's true. from going That's That's true. And <laughs> it's legal in the sense that they do not recognize dual passport holders. So, Got it. All right. Let's get some of the questions from the audience, which um, this, this is the first one, and I'll, I'll say it. And then if someone really feels like they want to ask it, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll, I'll assign it. Can you talk about Iran's relationship with its neighbors, i.e. Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Yemen? And what about terrorism support in Yemen and Hezbollah? Well, bam. I mean, I have an answer. I mean, look, I mean, I think um, uh, Iran has a negative relationship with most of its neighbors. And, and this goes uh, back much farther than the revolution. I mean, if you go back in the 1960s and 70s, Iran and Saudi Arabia were contesting uh, control over the uh, Persian Gulf. They're even contesting the fact that it's named the Persian Gulf, with one side called it the Arabian, the other side called it the Persian Gulf. And, and there are classic power dynamic issues that are involved here of two different populations that largely practice uh, different forms of Islam um, that also have got historical beefs and their tribal differences and they're just you know, long standing cultural differences. When you add on top of it, the fact that Iran is ruled by a revolutionary government that likes and, and supports overthrowing monarchies, it's not a surprise that the monarchies in the uh, you know, west part of the, the Gulf are, are concerned. And I think the fact that Iran also supports you know, groups like the Houthis in Yemen and Hezbollah and Lebanon and Assad in Syria directly against the interests of, of Gulf Arab states only contributes to some of this, this problem. But I, I think I would, I would also step back and say let, let's bear in mind that these are foreign policy challenges that we had before we had a nuclear weapons problem inside of Iran. These are foreign policy challenges that we have after we uh, had a nuclear weapons program problem, and they are challenges we will have now. I mean, th this is the, the same thing, frankly, as looking at the South China Seas. You are going to have difficulties in the South China Seas because you have different countries with all have different interests there. The fact that um, it happens to be in the Middle East, the fact that it involves some of our close partners, adds some importance in our mind, but it's really no different than a lot of other foreign policy challenges that we face. Interesting. Well, I think some of what I'm hearing is uh, a lot of the reaction to the Iran deal isn't necessarily specific to the deal, like the things in the deal, but rather Iran. Um, and I, I, I want to, before I go on, did anyone, did you want to mention anything about the, the sure, neighbors? Sir, and I agree very much with what uh, Richard was saying. I would just say that it's very clear that we have a giant fault line now in the region between the Sunnis, and particularly the Wahhabi version of it, and the Shia. But it would be a big mistake to think that all Shia groups are somehow manipulated puppets of Iran. And that includes Hezbollah. Uh, but certainly the Houthi in Yemen, this is a civil war that it has its own roots for the last 20 years in Yemen. I, I think the Saudi Arabian propaganda would like us all to believe this is somehow an Iranian-Saudi uh, proxy war in Yemen, and there may be some uh, small dimension of that. But the Shia issues, and for that many al-Qaeda issues in Yemen, aren't really all that central to Iran. Uh, Iran is providing some support, but this has its own dynamic which I think Saudi Arabia would like us to take a very simple view of, which is wrong. It, Obviously, the civil war in Syria is also enormously complicated. And yes, Iran is now supporting Assad, no doubt about that, uh, partly because they're Shias, same with Hezbollah. Uh, but the civil wars in all these places are, you know, have their own dynamics to them. We could spend a whole afternoon yeah. trying to unravel them but it's very simple, I think, overly simple. I thought during the Cold War, we often tried to understand complicated regional conflicts, the war in Vietnam, for example, as if it was all just Soviet-inspired without nearly enough attention to what was actually happening uh, on the ground in Vietnam or wherever, Angola, Cambodia, 
you name it. And I think the same now in the Middle East. We've globbed on to some very simple stories about Iran, Saudi Arabia, proxy wars, which explains some. But it doesn't go uh, all that far because quickly it breaks down in, as, as most simple metaphors do. I think um, Rick and Richard have, have covered, okay. uh, I mean, I think it, it's worth remembering Iran is not Arab, it's Persian. It's an old, a very cohesive uh, culture, and the boundaries of the country are much, much older than the, the Arab states. Um, it is a Shia country. Shias are about 15% of the Middle East. The Saudis are used, the Saudis and the Egyptians, who are now kind of bit out of it, but used to being the leading Sunni powers. Iran's the leading Shia power. All this has nothing to do with nuclear, only, mm -hmm. um, and, and, but has been massively, massively exacerbated by the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And you, you cannot look at this region today without recognizing that most people there, the reason there's such antagonism to the US in most of the region is because they feel like you broke it and now you're talking about pulling back. Um, and so that's what, you know, that's what's fueling this enormous anger. Um, but the other thing is we had a very close tight, warm, long-lasting relationship with the Shah before the revolution. And the Gulf countries, which sit across a tiny body of water from, from Iran, are frightened that the deal means that before they know it, we're, we're going to be back in an embrace with Iran. So, and, and then, of course, Israel, not Israel, Netanyahu um, is frightened of the same thing, even though Israel also had a very good relationship with Iran before the revolution. You tell us about that. Iran and Israel had a yeah. I mean, Ar tell us about Ar Iran that. and Israel had a very close uh, working relationship back in the '60s and '70s, and and in fact, I mean, the U.S., Iran, and Israel had a very tight working relationship. Yeah. And and you know, I, I think that it speaks again to the fact that. Um, while we can have very simple metaphors for it's you know Jews versus Muslims in the Middle East, or it's you know Shia versus Sunni, or it's different groups. I mean, I think those metaphors do break down because there's also a lot of realpolitik that gets involved in this. You know, and the fact that you know in certain circumstances it's been uh, in Israel's best interest to support certain countries and to work with certain countries, and the same thing uh, with regard to us. And I think ultimately what it speaks is the fact that the the, the issues that are in the Middle East are much more complicated than than simple uh, metaphors would be. Yeah. It's a challenge, and part of what we do at the council is work and to bring public, bring public awareness to complicated issues, which is a very challenging topic. I appreciated that you took us a step back and said, um, you know, not the whole Middle East and isn't all the same. Um, you know, I think about the Southwest Airlines, the, the gentleman who was uh, kicked off the plane for because he was speaking Arabic. Not everyone who speaks Arabic is, uh, you know, a, a threat. Um, and the Sunni Shia is, is very helpful because I think in the American public, the complicated, sophisticated uh, components of, of, the, of the deal, of the dynamics of the relationship are, are lost on, on most. Perhaps they don't spend the time or know, know enough to get into it. So this is very, very helpful. More questions from the audience. And this gets to um, the question or the, the fact that Iran is the best educated nation in the Middle East. Um, so it's asking, the person is asking, will anti-U.S. sentiment grow or diminish given that the, Iran is the best educated nation in the Middle East? Would you like to comment on that since you mentioned well, it I, as a... I, <laughs> it's a paradox, isn't it, that, that after all these years of, of deep freeze and no contact mm. at all for 30 plus years, an American diplomat can get, could get demoted for shaking the hand of an Iranian diplomat. Um, but I think the answer to the question depends entirely on whether the deal holds up and whether it's the sanctions relief becomes real. And it's not 100%. I mean, it's, it's largely based on us. Um, if a, if a, it's hard to believe that this would happen, but if a newly elected president came in and said, well, I promised in the campaign I'd throw this away on day one, 
we will be throwing away what I think on the merits is a complete no-brainer. It will be the first major crisis we've solved diplomatically in a very long time. It will, we got so much more than we gave. Um, but the Iranians have to make it real. They've got to do their part to, to do economic and political reform in the country that makes it <coughs> worthwhile for foreign businesses to take the risk. But we've got to clear up the mushiness in our sanctions situation that, that, that lifts some of the risk and the fear of going in. I like, I like that, clear up the mushiness. I, Go ahead, Rick. I think that um, over the last eight years, besides the nuclear deal, which I think there is a lot of consensus among national security experts on, we have had a debate about how best to bring more pro-American sentiment to Iran and less anti-American sentiment. And I think initially in the Obama administration, a strategy of engagement was what he started. And in 2009, there was a presidential election there that led huge mass demonstrations on the street in Iran and a green movement and a lot of enthusiasm in this country and in Iran for a real turning point. But it wasn't a turning point. The hard right in Iran, the, the Basij and many others, vigilantes who support this authoritarian regime, just clamped down, arrested all that leadership, threw them in jail, and started talking about velvet subversion that Obama was more dangerous to them than George W. Bush had been, because George W. Bush, with his openly confrontational position, allowed the country to rally to the conservatives within Iran, where Obama was coming with this velvet subversion. He was going to fake them out and create you know, a, a Soviet Union-type collapse from the inside out. And I don't think that fear among Iranian hardliners is gone. I think it's, the nuclear deal has simply become the new vehicle that will allow Western engagement. And what we think through engagement, yes, will subvert them from within, much like people think happened in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, that you'll generate interest in Iran that go back to that very positive pro-American sentiment. But when you ask me, will there be more or less anti-Americanism, that is going to threaten the, the traditional interests that for the last 30 years, all my adult life, have gained from this revolution. And their children who are now 30 years old who know perfectly well if the diaspora comes back, if they truly globalize, their privileged position in Iran is going to collapse. And I don't think they're going to go without a fight. So now. I don't know. They're fighting now. They're fighting but now. I think it's also important to say that Iranians are looking at Afghanistan, at Syria, and Iraq. And the, they would like to see change in their existing regime. They don't want regime change. Because they look around the region and it's a catastrophe where there has been regime change. Good, thank you. Uh, Richard, maybe we'll pass this one to you. It's about sanctions. The U.S. is releasing the money it previously withheld from sanctions. Who is that money going to? Diaspora versus Revolutionary Guard versus other? No, it's a great question. It was one of the bigger controversies of the deal. Let, let's first start off by accounting for the money here. So a lot of folks have, have gotten their heads that there's $150 billion of Iranian assets that were put on a plane and sent to Tehran on the first day of the deal. That is not true. Okay? $150 billion was the estimate that the U.S. government had of total Iranian restricted funds. Okay? So that was money that was stuck in Iran that they couldn't use. It was gold reserves stuck in Iran that they can't use. It was oil money that was stuck in China, Turkey, South Korea, Japan um, that they couldn't use freely. It was money that had been obligated to projects that they already committed to. It was a whole basket of, of, of funds. And the Treasury Department last summer came out with a revised estimate of not what the total assets frozen was, what the total assets restricted was, but what could they actually move around freely. And the estimate of that was around $56 billion, so a third of what had been estimated. Um, the uh, Iranians estimated that the total amount that they had free to use was about $36 billion, so even smaller than that, because they obviously have got some internal figures about what they were able to use. Secretary of State Kerry said yesterday that the Iranians have only been able to move $3 billion of that potentially 56, but most likely $36 billion that they've had access to, 
and that what they've been doing with it is essentially buying goods and engaging in trade finance, which is really what I think Iran's going to do. If you think about it, Iran had all of this oil money, which is basically all the restricted funds, uh, coming in and flowing into the country up until February of 2013, when we restricted it. So it's only two years that Iran's been under these sets of restrictions. We know what they were doing with that money when they had it. They were spending on infrastructure projects. They were spending on development projects. And yes, they were spending some of it in support for terrorism. But if you look at the numbers and the amount that they were engaged in in all these various activities, it was around $10 billion that they were investing in terror support. Now, that's a lot. I'm not going to say it's a lot. But the subject of, of sanctions only dropped that number to about 5 to $6 billion. So the actual degradation as a result of sanctions was fairly modest. That tells you two things. One, Iran has prioritized support for terrorism as part of its foreign policy. That is the problem, not the fact that they've now got more money for it. And the fact that they are prepared to budget for support for terrorism, notwithstanding sanctions, tells you they support terrorism a lot. And we've got to deal with that fundamental problem. But the additional resource isn't going to change this. The second point I would make let me, is... Let me just interrupt. Do they actually have a line item in the budget that says supporting international terrorism? I mean, it says support for Assad. Support for Assad. So support for Hezbollah. Support for IRGC. Support for the Quds Force. Uh, the same way we would have support for, from their uh, figuring, support for CIA. Support for DOD. Um, the second point I would make, just related to all this, is, you know, we, we were talking earlier about the, uh, the elections. Rouhani was elected on a campaign platform of development and getting this government and this, this country back online. He is a politician. He wants to be reelected. And even though the Supreme Leader allowed him to get elected in the first place, there's no guarantee in the future. And if he actually does want to experience that, he's got to get this economy running in short order. All that speaks to the idea that 150, not even 56, billion dollars aren't going to be flooding into terrorism anytime soon. Next question. Did the rise of ISIS contribute to U.S.-Iran cooperation on this deal? What do you think, Rick? you want to? I think no? Richard was Richard involved was, with yeah. the negotiations. Oh, okay. I, we should ask him that. No, I'm, I'll tell you bluntly the answer is no. Um, I was a party to the negotiating process from August of 2013 until January of 2015. Um, I was at all the meetings that uh, John Kerry had with uh, Javad Zarif, as well as many other uh, lower level meetings. Um, the issue of Syria came up, it, to my memory, exactly once. Um, it was an aside as people were waiting for another meeting to end. Um, and the, the upshot is uh, our negotiating posture was we focus on the nuclear issue, not on ISIS. The fact that we've got shared interests in defeating ISIS and the fact that we both believe ISIS should be defeated, I don't think uh, led to any real cooperation. Great. Thank you. What are the challenges Iran faces with Russia, particularly Putin? Well, I think uh, traditionally the American assumption was that Iranians were hostile to certainly the Soviet Union and to Russia. I don't think I think that's vastly exaggerated. I think uh, Russia has played a fairly sophisticated hand with Iran over the last decade or so. Uh, they're on the same team when it uh, comes to supporting Assad. Um, they uh, both argue that regime change from outside is wrong. And the Iranian position on Syria and the Russian position on Syria is that regime change from the outside they see both Saudi Arabia, Qatari, Turkish, American interference in Syria as an effort for outside forces to overthrow the government of Syria. And, and if it's allowed in Syria the way it was previously in Libya, then what's to stop it from affecting many other places? And I think, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, the regime in Iran continues to worry about regime change. And I think they will always worry about regime change because I think the mass base that supports them is quite small, and they know that. And it's an inherently insecure regime. There's no way to completely reassure it. Uh, and coming back to your early question, I don't know how much of the resources that they gain will strengthen the hands of conservatives and the Supreme Leader and the Basij and others, as opposed to flow to a, you know, a, lack of a better word, a middle class in Iran that would eventually you know, grow and demand even more change. But I think Russia's relationship with, with Iran is likely to be improving over the short run rather than in any kind of real conflict. The, the interesting question is why Russia didn't blow it up, didn't blow up the negotiations. I think most of us who watched these negotiations over the course of a year and a half closely 
um, expected that Russia would, at the last minute, uh, throw a monkey wrench in. After all, this was a US-led negotiation, and they were part of our team. And they, um, they, st they stood to lose a privileged position with Iran. Uh, Iran remains a potentially important market for them, but um, I think Putin surprised us all. We're going to do the quick speed round here. Um, I, I have a one. This uh, oh, this is a question, but I'm not sure if it's rhetorical. Keep your friends close and your enemies even closer. How long do you think before American understand this quote when it comes to foreign affairs? Let's just leave that one open. You don't need to respond, but um, maybe you can respond to this as we close out in a brief. So the next president comes in, and folks who come to these often know this is one of my questions. And then, and if it's doesn't matter who it is, but you got a minute and a half. Um, you're walking around the, the West Wing, and they're about to get in the elevator, and the doors are closed, and they say, Rick, Richard, Jessica, why should I maintain the agreement? And still, be, and still remain president. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is the, not the specifics of the deal, but the fact that the elected you know, this is an elected position who has to deal with. Um, well, keep in mind, they all seconds. they all know there's a big difference between what you can say in the campaign trail and what you can do when you're president. Um, I think uh, because probably the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff would be sitting on their side and saying, well, "What's the alternative? And what are you exactly asking us to do? And how are we going to do that? Get real." You know, I think you would say you want to keep the agreement because it, for military reasons makes good sense. And we've got our hands pretty full fighting ISIS, Syria, Iraq, to take on a major military uh, activity with Iran or to release them from sanctions and allow them to do that for 10 years um, isn't a good move. The likelihood of doing more than containing the sanctions regime we currently have with this second order banking restriction. Once we walk away from this deal, Will the Europeans, will the Russians, will the Chinese stick with us, or will they decide, oh, gosh, you guys act in bad faith? Mm. And so I, I think it's the reason we haven't used force previously and the reason no one in the military establishment in Israel wants to use force. There aren't any good alternatives that way. Richard? Yeah, no, I, I think those are all the main points. I guess I would say two things in addition to that. I mean, assuming the deal is continuing to be implemented, you know, fully by Iran and that its compliance has been verified, the, the first thing you'd say is, why would we walk away from something that's working? Because we've now got Iran a year away from a nuclear bomb for 10 to 15 years, and that's better than the, what we could have had before. And the second point comes down to, and, and if you want to walk away from this, do you think we're going to be able to rebuild the sanctions regime? And the key point about all this is, it's not just that the deal ends, it's how the deal ends, either tomorrow or 10 to 15 years from now, that's so important. If the deal is to break down, we need it to be because of Iran. Iran needs to have cheated on its obligations so we can galvanize world support to do something about it. If we're seen as walking away from a significant diplomatic achievement without a plan B that doesn't involve military force and potential regime destabilizing actions in the region, then people are going to be wondering, what the heck are we thinking and why do we want to enter into another conflict? And they won't support us. Jessica, they said everything that needed to be said to the next president? Yeah. Great. I mean, this one is, I, I have never seen, I think, a major international national security issue where there is greater, um, less understanding of, mm. uh, we had a win here, a big, big win. Richard, in his introduction, didn't even mention that the Iranians shipped out of the country 98% of their enriched uranium stockpile. That's stuff they've already paid for and made, stuff that Iranian scientists got assassinated for, stuff, I mean, they have paid big time for their efforts to do develop a nuclear weapon. They gave it up. You don't pull the centrifuges out of storage after 10 years and expect them to work again. Um, we got a better deal I think, than anybody thought going in. And here there's most of the country and certainly um, the Republican candidates walking around saying, we gotta get rid of it. It makes, it, it, it just doesn't make sense.
Great. Please join me in thanking our distinguished speakers. <laughs> and thank you for being here today. Thank you, World Affairs Council of America, the Iran Project, and all of you. We are adjourned. Thank you.